always nice to be here, and, and we'll make this a little bit informal, so clearly if you have questions, I'll try to address them throughout or at the end. I'm a little bit um, at, heading to the airport when I finish here, so I'll be at the back for a few minutes as well if you have, have some questions. So let me, and, and thank you for the folks that stopped by the booth. My, my friends were very happy to get a blood meal from someone else besides myself. Um, if you haven't seen live bed bugs, stop by the Orkin booth back there. We have some friends that would love to see you. Um, well, what, what do you do then when you get that report that you have bed bugs? Suicide. Suicide, yeah. <laughs> well, I hope that doesn't happen, but I know how some of you might feel frustrated and concerned about that. And so what I wanted to do was we've had some great discussions so far and kind of go through the, the step by step. Um, first of all, when you have them and then what the pest control professional is going to do a little bit for you as well so that you have all that kind of put in together. Um, you know, it is a really challenging situation, and um, I know myself have changed significantly now that bed bugs are a problem. Every hotel room I go in, I inspect to make sure they're not there, and I travel significantly. And you know that something that you feel on your body gives you a jolt, and you look and see, you know, it usually isn't a bed bug. So I think we've all moved into a, into a world of more awareness than we probably did um, before. I wanted to kind of start for just a, a second and give you just a little preliminary of, of, of the history of, of bed bugs so that we'll know the future because I'm going to end with that. Um, there was some recent work that was done at NC State about where they came from and I'll pose this question to you. If I was to take the bed bug populations in the United States and look at their genetics, would they be related to each other or not? Anyone want to pose a guess? They're really not related. So what does that mean? There are multiple introductions that happened in this country. And so therefore, it wasn't one introduction into New York City and then it exploded or someone decided to do some bioterrorism thing and give us a colony and it exploded. Multiple have come in. So what does that mean for the future? Again, there's going to be multiple opportunities for this bet. So if you think, uh, you know, Orkin or pest control is going to get them under control, this is a worldwide epidemic. I was just at a conference two weeks ago. Japan had practically no bed bugs into 2009, and now it's just going like crazy. Germany followed the same pattern. Now, the United States, 2003, 2004 was our period, and Canada was the same. But as long then as people from out throughout the world are traveling every which way, you're going to continue to see this as an issue. Now, let me follow on another interesting genetic work that was done at NC State. What if I looked at the genetic similarity within an apartment? or a hotel, do you think that is diverse or similar? And similar is the answer to that. That's exactly right. That means that there's a single introduction into that apartment and then it spreads out or that hotel or that hospital unlike the diversity that's out there in the actual country. That's an important concept for anyone in, in multifamily housing or in hospitality. That means you've got to contain and eliminate that or that problem is going to continue. You know, the question of where did they go? Well, clearly this was a, a, we want to take a little credit in pest control. We really can't. It was a chemical, but it wasn't really the chemical. It was who could get the chemical. Who could get a hold of DDT in the late 50s? Everybody, exactly right. Therefore, you could spray it on the beds. You could, in fact, wallpaper from Disney actually had um, um, DDT incorporated into it. So when we heard Gene Harrington speak about um, the, the issues that Ohio faced with EPA and trying to get Proxer covered, I don't think that's going to happen again. We may get a good chemical in the pest control industry, and I think we do have good products. I have complete confidence if you call me and ask me to do a service in your home or apartment or hospital, we'll get it taken care of. But unfortunately, you can't go to the drugstore, can't go to the box store and get a product that's going to be the same as what we have. And the government doesn't appear to be helping us with that. So they did go because of access to chemicals by the layperson, but I don't think that's going to change. And then this question of why are they here, and that's what I want to get a little bit more into. This bug is very different from ants and cockroaches and rodents and everything else that you've dealt with. And there's three things I'd like each of you to take home with you that makes this pest very different. The three issues are this is not a pest of dogs or cats or possums or squirrels. It is our pest. And we clearly know that because we're quite different from those animals because of what? Hair or fur. 
If you want to try an experiment, I'd be happy to give you some bed bugs. Take them home and sleep with your dog and see who gets bit. I promise you, it's going to be you. Now, if you want your dog to suffer, shave all the hair off. It'll happily eat that, feed on that dog. And therefore, you know, ladies, if you want to prevent getting bit, sh don't shave your legs anymore. That's going to help you just a little bit. Bed bugs do not like hair. Now, if they don't have anything, if they, all they have is hair, they'll fight through it and get it. But when I feed my bed bug colony, I always feed on the underside of my arm rather than on the top because I have a lot more hair on the top of my arm. So this pest has evolved to be ours. We can't blame anybody or anything but us. Now, they've evolved from caves, as, as I think was mentioned earlier. So they like it cool, 65 degrees. So you don't have kids coming to school with bed bugs stuck on their, on their neck or on their arms. They're where? On their backpack and their suitcase and their purse. So this pest is really one that we carry around, either on furniture or on personal belongings, but not on our body. Rarely is it actually on our body. So number one, this is our pest. Number two is the only thing they eat is blood, nothing else. So it doesn't matter whether you're clean or dirty or whether you're in a five-star hotel or a one-star hotel, they want just a blood meal. Now clearly if you come to me with a very cluttered apartment and say, get these under control, we'll have a much tougher time to do that than if there's not as much clutter. But it doesn't make any difference for the survival because all they want is that blood meal. And the last component, which is very important to understand, is the way that they reproduce. They re reproduce in a way called traumatic insemination. What that means is even though the female has a vagina, the male doesn't use it. He has a spear on his penis that penetrates her stomach. That's why it's called traumatic insemination. Why that's so important to understand is, first of all, this pest does not multiply like crazy. If you do nothing with it, it's going to get more. But you don't wake up one night like cockroaches and have 50 of them running around. Females will lay about one or two eggs a day. The reason she doesn't lay so many is she has to heal from that wound. So remember, if you go into an apartment and you find 50 bed bugs, they've been there a long time. But the most important thing about traumatic insemination has to deal with the female's interest in sex. Most insects only have to mate once, and bed bug females are the same way. Unfortunately, male bed bugs are like humans. They'd like to do it more than once. So therefore, when that female has mated once and the male comes around the second time, what does she do? She runs away. So rather than being on one side of the mattress, she moves to the other side of the mattress and then to the baseboard and then to the apartment or the hotel room next door. This is a migrating pest. If you don't get it under control quickly, what's going to happen? Everybody gets that guest, and it certainly isn't one that the neighbors want. So the point is, early intervention is so important. And so now when I'm going to talk a little bit more about a treatment strategy and what you need to do, hope that gets you, puts you into a little bit of perspective. First of all then, when you think you have bed bugs, there has to be a proper assessment. Now I was, I, 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 to be honest, I was quite surprised when people came to the booth and they said, I can see them. Yeah, bed bugs are good size. They're the size of a tick. They're not minuscule and, un and, 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 un and un unable to see. The babies are very small. But this is a good sized pest. So clearly you could collect one. If you don't recognize it, you could give it to the extension service or a pest control professional like, like my company and make sure that's what you have. Most are not, thank heaven. So don't move into the direction of having a, a service done unless you guarantee that you know what that actually is. That can be done by monitoring and checking and things of that sort. Um, but first of all, identify. Then you want to say, how big is this problem? If you bring in a male or a virgin female or a baby, is it going to reproduce? No. So therefore, one bed bug may not be that big of a deal. So bringing in an individual versus an infestation is quite different. And so you need to assess that. An infestation to me, or the terminologies that I use, are all stages are present. Eggs, nymphs, and adults. That's a problem. But one or two bed bugs is not. And that may be that there won't be a breeding population. You can very easily get that under control. So ask that question of your professional. Is it an, is it an introduction or an infestation? Next of all, how long have you had it? The extensiveness of this problem is pretty big to understand. Maybe if it's one or two or three or four that's hanging around that bed, you haven't got the migration going on to traumatic insemination. 
you probably can therefore have an isolated situation. On the other hand, if I find over 10 adults, more than likely there's been some migration going on. Therefore, all of the adjoining apartments or hotel rooms have to be inspected and therefore treated on those common walls, ceilings, and floors. That's important. And it isn't because the pest control professional wants to make an extra nickel off you. It's because traumatic insemination is encouraging that movement. So therefore, assess how big of a problem it actually is. Actually, sometimes people come and say, well, you've got to move everything out of the closet. You've got to wash and dry it all. You have to, well, if, the, if it's not that extensive, then you may not need to do that. That's why a professional that knows what they're doing can actually assess. It looks like an isolated situation. It isn't as extensive. If you came to my family and said every closet in the house had to be cleaned out, everything had to be washed, every I mean, that would take me days to get that ready to go. Why would I need to do that if I don't have to? So make sure and understand the degree of how extensive your problem actually is. Next of all, where are they coming from? There are bugs that look almost like bed bugs that are called bat bugs. They live up in attics, they live around bats. When you get rid of the bats, they may move down. So if the movement is coming from above rather than down below, it may be a different pest. And all of the work you do around baseboards and stuff will have no impact on bat bugs. Second of all, that neighbor that lives next door that no one ever goes in to see, that may be where the bed bugs are. So therefore, you're doing all of this work, no one has done work next door, and they keep migrating over. So that has to be a community-based, you know, checking, we got to get in that apartment. We got to see what's happening because there may be suffering, someone suffering because of that migration. And so that's source and inspection. Okay, next. So we have bed bugs. It's a pretty good infestation. We're ready to do something. So you look, you pull a baseboard back, you move, you look at an edge of a mattress and you see bed bugs. What do you do? Well, it's a little bit like a cockroach. I used to have a technician that he'd say, well, when I see a cockroach, I put bait in front of it. No, you don't. You use your boot and you squish it. It's the same type of an issue with a bed bug. You're prepared to reduce your population. So vacuums, from my perspective, are huge. You can really help yourself by reducing a population when you see them. So if you're going in there as the first individual and there's bed bugs there, don't run out. Get on your Tyvek suit. Get prepared like was talked about by the first um, responders. Great presentation that I heard here. And start vacuuming. Reducing populations can be very, very helpful. And sometimes you have to scrape a little bit. The eggs will be glued a little bit so that, you know, use a little the wand to help. Now some of you might say, what do I do with these bed bugs that are milling around in a wet vac or a vacuum cleaner? There's a couple things you can do. A little bit of sand whipping around will often cut some of the cuticles, so a little sand in a wet vac or a vacuum helps. But in even a better way, on your wand, have your wife or girlfriend or mother give you some, some pantyhose, and if you'll put one in between, you know, when you put the two pieces together, when those bed bugs are sucked up, they'll get caught in that little um, pantyhose or that little nylon. Bed bugs go from anywhere from a dollar to three dollars a piece. So you could actually sell them or just wrap it up and burn them, whatever you feel would make you happy. But the point is you've got them confined in an area rather than you know, running around inside of a vacuum. So first of all, reduce your population as much as you possibly can. I promise you, you won't get them all. But why not reduce it by 50, 60 percent rather than worrying about having pest, uh, a pest control professional come in? You can steam them. Um, and, and there's portable steamers that you can get out there. Some of them are more expensive than others. Um, bed bugs, and I think it was mentioned before, if not, I'll make the comment. Bed bugs die at 122 for one second, and that's all stages, eggs, nymphs, and adults. So steamers, which get up to 212, will certainly take care of that. A couple problems with steam. If you put it on your hand, it's probably going to burn you. If you, a bed bug's kind of sitting loosely, it'll blow it across, the, so that's a little bit of a challenge. Steam will only penetrate maybe a half to three quarters of an inch. So if you think you're steaming on the top of the mattress and it's going all the way down in the mattress, you're not. You're basically getting quite surface type conditions. But that again, you find bed bugs in an area, you don't want to vacuum, you can steam that area and kill most of them and that can again help reduce the population. Next point is cold. Let me, I said that the heat extreme temperatures is 122. Now someone out there who's doing research saying, well Ron, what if I have it at 118? It's all time temperature related. Cooler, longer periods of time still kill them. 113 will kill bed bugs if you keep them there for a couple of hours. So it's all time temperature. Let's go low end. 
There was a study, not a study, we actually have a branch up in Michigan who had some infested furniture and stuck it outside of the branch in the middle of last winter. The temperatures were quite extreme. You would go down to about 20 to 14 to 20 degrees, then it would get up to close to freezing. And this went back and forth for about a month. We went out there, looked at the bedding and, and other furniture. There were still live bed bugs in it. So what we have found from University of Minnesota from Dr. Kell's lab is at zero degrees Fahrenheit, so this isn't 32, this is zero Fahrenheit for seven days kills all stages of bed bugs. So thinking that you're going to stick your furniture out on the patio for the evening and that's all it takes to get rid of the bed bugs is not going to happen. Now maybe if you were way north in Canada where it gets very, very cold, that may be an option. But clearly this seven days at zero degrees has to happen. Now some of you may be aware that there's a, there's a, 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 a cryonite unit that creates very cold conditions from CO2 and it will kill bed bugs without a doubt. A couple of things to be aware of, it blows them, it'll burn your skin just like the steam does but it doesn't penetrate very much. So remember, the steam goes down about a half to three quarters of an inch, but the cryoniter goes even less than that. In fact, I've had bed bugs underneath a sheet of paper, and they lived with the cryoniter, the freezing on top. So you've got to make sure if you use cryonite or, or freezing that you get it directly on them. So first of all, if you've got bed bugs and, and someone's coming and reduce the population. Next. Bed bugs want to hang out as close to the blood mill as they possibly can. In fact, studies indicate that they will be attracted to your CO2 anywhere from six, four to six feet. So therefore, that mattress box spring seems to be a perfect location for them. Now, I say back box, mattress and box spring, but in, in Connecticut about six months ago, I was up there helping our technicians do a service, and they said, you know, we've got the room perfect, the bed's taken care of, but the, the, the lady says she's still getting bit. This was an older lady. And um, so, sure enough, it was beautiful. They'd done a great job in the room. And so I say to the lady, um, where do you usually hang out at nights? And she says, oh, well, I never use the bedroom. I sleep in my lazy boy chair in front of the TV. Boy, I'll tell you, that chair was loaded with bed bugs. And so when I say doctoring the mattress, I really mean that piece of furniture that you're sleeping on has to be considered. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you at this point. A bo ba box spring, a mattress, a couch, soft furniture is very, very difficult to guarantee that bed bugs are all taken care of in them. So what should you do? I believe that you, you do the, as much killing as you possibly can through steam, through cryonite, or you can actually use alcohol. Sterifab can be used on the surface. It volatilizes very quickly. But still, I can't promise you that that furniture is bed bug free, so I like to encase it. I like to put a mattress encasement and a box spring encasement on those pieces of furniture. Now you say, what do I do about the couch? There's actually encasements for couches. Looks like a big pillow, but maybe if you put decorative pillows it wouldn't look so bad. But I, I, I guess the point is though, if you couldn't afford replacing the couch, then maybe that would be an option. But I have not found, if you say, oh, I love this couch, i got to keep this couch, I can't get rid of the couch, then quarantine it if it's infested for that year. Bed bugs can live a year without a blood meal. Quarantine it, then bring it back out. But if you ask me to guarantee, the only way I can guarantee that I got them all was to completely fumigate it with some type of a gas or completely cook it to that 122, as I mentioned. If you say, oh, spray the underside of it, try to steam it, I cannot guarantee that. So encasements are really important. And, and let me make a comment on encasements for just a second. There are four things that are very important about an encasement. First of all, make sure that the bed bug cannot stick its beak through the top surface. So just getting a mattress cover will not solve that problem. Um, and because bed bugs, if you're naked against a sheet, will actually be able to penetrate through and get a blood meal. So you want to make sure that the covering is penetration proof. Second of all, the zipper teeth have to be tight enough. The zippers on your jeans, bed bugs can slip through that, so make sure those zippers have tighter teeth. Number three, there has to be some clasp so that the bed bug cannot slip around the zipper at the end of it. Make sure that they are secured and done properly. And last of all, the, the stitching along seams, if there's much pressure on some of those, they'll pull apart just enough for a little bed bug to fit through. So make sure that mattress encasement has double stitching or has some type of that if you pull that the little holes don't create around those seams to let them come through and out. 
So encasements, I believe, and if you can only get one encasement, it's more important to get it for the box spring than for the mattress. Bed bugs are more often to be in box springs than mattresses. I prefer both if you possibly can. Um, in reference, just one other um, um, kind of comment about that. That won't protect you from bed bugs. It'll protect your mattress and box spring from getting bed bugs and therefore having to throw it out. The mattress encasement doesn't do anything from a new introduction. It just protects that furniture or that pretty expensive in investment from bed bugs getting in it. Question? Please. Is that the same for foam mattresses? Do they live in foam mattresses like Tempur-Pedic does, or is this just regular mattresses? Well, any crack or crevice that's made out of some type of fabric, they'll like to hang in. Water beds, I've seen them on water beds, and there's each of that plastic and those you know, things around that. So any, but, but again, they like it dark and quiet and, and, and um, um, you know, close to the food source. So there are some that are more apt than others, but I have seen bed bugs in all situations on every type of a bed. Now, I know you might say, well, my mattress, I can't get the encasement or it doesn't seem to fit, but, but they will find um, ways to hang out there. And of course, if it's an older mattress that slid or ripped or tore, they'll be inside of it. But again, protecting that by an encasement can help. Please. Yeah, good. This is a, the question was, is what, what do other folks do with them? Well, a lot of folks look at us and say, what's the big deal? You know, they don't transmit diseases. You know, what, what are you so upset about? Um, and, and so um, this, this epidemic really is relatively recent for, for normal folks. Now, in some hostels and some other things. But the, the, the pesticides out there have been pretty effective. There have been hot spots throughout the world and low income and some other things like that. But this pest really is... Uh, a worldwide epidemic that has not been seen because pesticides have really kept them under control. But some folks will say, what's the big deal? We wash our sheets regularly, we vacuum. Yeah, you see one or two, it's not a big deal. It's a little bit like, we're kind of spoiled here in this country. We won't, we won't buy an apple with a wormhole in it. You know, we really, we, a fly comes in, we don't, you know, we're, we're really quite, our standard's higher than some other countries. But, but, but uh, um, basically, they live with them a little more than what we're willing to put up with. Yes, please. Natural predators, uh, bed bug eaters, uh, I'm sorry, would you say that one more time? Natural predators. Oh, natural predators, good question. Well, you've got to, when you think of natural predators, go to caves. Um, they're, they're, the birds will peck at them a little bit. Scorpions w w will. Some of the cave crickets will feed off of them. But in our ho homes, boy, I'll tell you, there isn't, um, I, I, I know that lizards will come out at night a little bit. Guinea hens and chickens, um, most of us probably prefer not to have those. So there aren't real natural predators for bed bugs inside people's homes, unfortunately. I, I'm sorry? Uh, you know, that's an interesting point. Um, we have done a study not long ago where we looked at spider populations in, in bed bug infested homes versus non homes, and they're higher. So spiders will feed on them without doubt. Um, you gotta have a pretty good population so that the bed bugs are crawling around getting in their nests. Some of the, some of the um, in this area you have um, brown recluse and, and they'll chase after them, wolf spiders will as well. I, I don't know how many folks would like us to release spiders as a control method, <laughs> but um, they, they, they certainly can help. Let me touch on though, we have seen um, um, carpet beetles on the increase in bed bug infested locations. And the carpet beetles aren't eating the bed bugs, the carpet beetles are eating the cast skins, or when bugs molt, then they come in and eat those. So we're seeing a little bit of that. But you're right, spiders could be in caves, they were there. We just don't think that's a much of a practical uh, opportunity. Let me now touch that. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Well, you, you asked me, two months versus six months is a lot. Um, if the temperature is warm, above 75 to 80 degrees for that six months, those bed bugs probably will not survive. If it's 65 to 70, we've kept bed bugs alive for a year. So it would depend on how long and the temperature to, to determine how well. 
an adult bed bug can live easily over six months in cool temperatures. The baby nymphs that have just hatched out, I keep them alive about a month without dying. So it depends on the age of the nymph for how long and the temperature are the two factors of how long they'll survive. But adult bed bugs without a blood mill can live for a year. Next then, once you're at the point of doing, so you've, you encase your mattresses or your soft furniture, you've got them out of the room. The next point is, is treatment. And you need to interview your pest control professional and say, what are you going to do? And this should be the answer, and if it's not, then you get another one. We are going to kill every bed bug that is here. If they don't say that, you got the wrong one. Because honestly, if that's not their mission, they're not going to do a good job for you. Now, will they miss one? Maybe. But the treatment strategy should be so thorough that any bed bug that moves around after that will come in contact with it. And so therefore, two types of formulated products should be used. A liquid in every single crack and crevice. And in reference to the liquid, I want to, and the dust, and then dust goes in every void. So every void has a dust, every crack and crevice has a liquid. And there's three specific things that you need to ask yourself about these products. First of all, are the bed bugs resistant to those products? Earlier, someone said that the reason that Ohio has such a problem is because different populations were resistant to pesticides. There are excellent pesticides out there that they're not resistant to, but there are definitely pesticides out there that we use for other pests that they are. So ask your pest control professional, are they resistant to the products that you're using? Second of all, is there a residual? How long will your product last behind that crack or crevice or in that void? Some products now are lasting six months. Others products, like some of the botanical products, like cedar oil and things, are inactive as soon as they land on the surface. So is it um, a, a residual? Are they resistant to it? And are they repelled by it? Meaning, if it comes to it, does it go away? That's going to be a problem. If you put a pesticide down and they just stay away for a month, that isn't so hot. So some products are non-repellents, meaning the bed bugs come back and forth through it very freely. So liquids and cracks and crevices, dust and voids, and make sure that you're understanding resistance because clearly some products should not be used, whether it's a dust or a liquid. And I jotted down then those traditionals of residual, resistant, and repellent or not. That is the traditional chemical approach to bed bug service. And I want to stand here with, with, with every bit of integrity that I have and tell you that I have great confidence that if it's done right and thoroughly, that method works. Now at Orkin, we use heat as well. So I'm not here to push one over another, and I'm not pushing our, my company over anyone's else. But, but when it comes to actually cost, usually heat's a little bit higher. And so you've got to weigh out what your needs and what your circumstance is. But a good pest control company will be able to get your bed bug control, get it under control with chemicals and not heat. On the other hand, heat is much, much faster. If you can get that temperature up to 122 and everything in that area to 122, the bed bugs are all done. Let me share with you something that's important though. If I'm a bed bug and heat comes at me in a convective way, I just kind of sit there. It's like a frog in cold water. When you slowly turn that heat up, it just kind of sits there till it's boiled. On the other hand, if I'm a bed bug and conductive heat comes towards me, meaning here is my baseboard and I'm behind here, I will run. So therefore, if I haven't got treatment in a surrounding areas where I'm going to run to, then that, that population is now going to explode in other locations. And we see that over and over and over again, that heat alone often isn't always the answer. So usually a combination is going to be part of that service, particularly on edges and places like that. And a recent study just came out and indicated that heating does not inactivate the chemicals that are put down. So you don't have to worry, well, if I heat it, will these products still work? Yes, even at 40 to 50, 100, excuse, 140 to 150 degrees, they are still working. So I, I'm not going to get into products here. Um, and I'd be happy to visit with anyone that wants to get specific. I certainly don't want to endorse one product or one manufacturer after another, or over another. But clearly, um, and I can give my cards, or you can get the cards from the Orkin folks back there, we'd be happy to advise you on what products that we think are very effective. Um, next thing I'd like to touch on, monitoring. And um, this is a big open door. 
and how effective was the service? Are those bites really bed bug bites? And so I'm going to touch a little bit on this here. There are a variety of monitoring techniques out there, and unfortunately, none of them are foolproof. Orkin uses all of these, and we know the pros and cons of them. So I have no dog in this fight. I know that Gary was up here, and, I, and I've worked with Gary, and I know he has a great dog there, but I'm going to be very honest with what I know. So these are tools in our toolbox to monitor. I'm not saying you'd use this one over that one. They all can be effective. First of all, DNA now is an exciting technology. You can use a PCR technology. If the, I know I have a lot of scientists or, or, or medical bound folks. Bed bugs, like my finger going across the surface, leave cells behind. If I can swab those cells up and send it to a lab that actually has the primer for bed bug DNA, it will tell me whether they cross that surface or not. So this is exciting, cool stuff, um, and it's quite available to, mo to, to, to folks out there. You can get on the internet, you can get through Orkin, but you actually therefore collect DNA. If, but the problem is, just like we all know, DNA doesn't denature immediately. So you may have done a service, dead bed bugs are do gone, you come back and swab, you may be getting old DNA. Therefore, you have to do techniques to wipe down surfaces to, to make sure that the surface is clean, and then you'll swab after that. But I like DNA as a very scientific approach, but if I swab here and the bed bug crawled over here, what am I going to get? A negative without a doubt. So it doesn't tell me only that I swabbed where bed bugs were. So you want to be swabbing where you think they are. The canine teams, and I should use canine teams over dogs. I, th I have seen them be extremely effective. On the other hand, I have seen them give false positives and false negatives. Some recent work which was done out of Rutgers University took an array of 33 teams and evaluated how effective they were, and they were less than 50%. Now, I don't want Gary's dog, probably great, and I'm not going to talk, but make sure you're very selective and make sure you understand that because taking just a canine team off the street may not be the one that you want to be using. Glue boards. Bed bugs in high populations will get on glue boards. On the other hand, typically they don't want to. So just putting glue boards around saying, oh, I don't have any bed bugs on them. I've seen them come to the glue board and move away. Then you get into traps. And I want to use the term, and, and, and we use when we talk about traps, active and passive monitoring. But to be honest, the pitfall trap, or the climb up is another term, is about as good of any monitor that's out there today. The problem is, you put it under your bed post, and you're the lure. So a lot of folks don't quite like in that, that, you know, if I have bed bugs, they're coming to get me, and maybe they'll be able to. But, but that certainly is an option. There is a new product. I just talked to a representative from, from the corporation that's producing them that has generated some CO2 and some chiromones and pheromones together as, as a, a product. It's going to be available in January. We're excited to test that product. So the, usually to monitor for bed bugs, you're looking at CO2, heat, and body odor or pheromones as the uh, a method to actually attract them. So what does the future hold with this pest? If you look, if you base the future on the past, uh, it doesn't look good for getting rid of bed bugs. Now, in a pest control professional, I'm saying, oh, well, I guess that's going to be good for us. But for you, I'm a little, I'm a little unhappy to report. I don't see good chemicals that you're going to get available to you on the horizon. Then you say, well, why is this population uh, or bed bugs continuing to, to, to increase? Well, we live, I, I think, luckily in a society that's pretty classless, meaning that we sh shop at the same place, we go to the same hospitals, we, you know, we, we all kind of mingle with each other. And therefore, the person that can't afford bed bug service may be living with bed bugs and suffering. And so therefore, it really lends us to be very, very aware. I hope nobody washes their sheets and doesn't inspect their mattress box bringing around the edge of the furniture. If you're not doing that, you're setting yourself up for a potential. I hope nobody travels without inspecting, without living out of your suitcase, making sure your, your, your suitcase is in the, in the tub at nights rather than just sitting next to the bed that you dry your clothes when you go home, and that you store your suitcase in your mother-in-law's room, not yours. The, 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 the reason is, is if you'll do some of these very proactive things, then you don't get bed bugs. These are, these are cultural things that we all need to incorporate 
because I just don't see this magic bullet chemical or this magic thing happening. Now, maybe it will, and I hope I eat my words, and I hope in two or three years there's something that works and bed bugs are gone again, but I question that that will really happen. So, when you think about the future, I think these monitors are looking exciting. That's a new thing. Be very aware of that. Um, you know, make sure you're, mo you, you know, thinking about what's really going to be happening, but I, in conclusion, really believe that it's our awareness and our vigilant individually which is going to keep us safe personally and those areas where we actually work. I think probably have a couple of questions, a couple of minutes for questions maybe before we finish. I, I want us to stay on skit, please, yes. Uh, why was CDC formed? Well, um, I, I'm not the complete authority, but um, it was, if, if we go back to the 1960s and talk about Dr. Rachel Carson and some of the data that she said where eggshells were being compromised, that species were being compromised due to that product, um, the government made a decision to pull it. Um, personally, many of us believe that uh, it, it, it was premature. We know that if you look at deaths throughout the world due to the, the non-use of that, there's been a lot more malaria deaths because of not having that product. But I'm certainly not the historian on it, but it was mainly some public sentiment based on early 1960 research and data saying that that maybe wasn't a very good um, pesticide for the environment. Please. Uh, I, I can't speak for any others, but most that I knew, know do yes. They come out and help you assess what's going on. I, I, I can speak for Orkin, and I know a lot of my other, um, other companies and colleagues that I work with would say yes to that, but I, I, I can't speak for all of them, but I would be quite surprised if most were not willing to help you figure out. Now, some of them, what they do is they'll come out, they may have a charge, or it may be free, and they'll put that towards a service. I think that you'd have to check and see what the, for each of them was. Yes, please. What can we bring to your market? Yeah, uh, if it's, it's actually a bit a service, we and, and I can only speak for Orkin, and I, this is not to be an advertisement, but many of the others are doing the same. They have a major bed bug certification. Our folks go through a four week program. Well, they have a basic training for themselves, but to become a bed bug technician, then there are there's hands on, there's there's live satellite, there's um, workbooks, they, it, tell, it takes them about four to eight weeks to complete it so that they actually become bed bug certified for our company. Um, the National Pest Management Association at this point does not have an actual certification for bed bugs. They're letting individual companies do it. But I would ask that question of your supplier. What do your technicians go through? We implemented this about a year ago and 3,000 of our employees have completed it. So we're really proud that our folks, and, and then we have folks that do termite and bird and other stuff so they wouldn't have got that training, but all of our bed bug folks have completed it. Yes, please. We've, we, we've looked at that, and as a contact, it works. And so in circumstances, you know, when you're trying to, con but when long-term residual, we don't see it as, as a major part. But, but we, we've worked with that. And so when you go into doing contact, get, reducing populations and all, we think there's some value with that. But, but to say, I put this out and I'm not going to have bed bugs again, I think that we, we don't see that as being a, a long-term residual method. Please. The first responders was really interesting. I appreciate what they, because we follow a lot of that. It depends on what they run into. If they're going in there to do a general inspection, they're going to be in regular clothes. But if they know that there are bed bugs, our recommendation to them is they're in Tyvek suits with booties, and therefore that is taken off when they leave and bagged up so that they do not take them to their trucks, they do not take them home. And then even in that environment, we're asking them when they get home, if they've done a big bed bug service, to take all their clothes off um, and put them in the dryer as well as their shoes in a, in a pillowcase in the dryer to make sure and then have a shower right then. Great, thank you very much.